Hello everybody! It's Wednesday and it's time for Arctic Game Talk again. Hello! Pleasure to have you here. My name is Johan Linder and this is my colleague Christopher Wiker. Super nice to have you here again. So, um, some Arctic Game Lab news. Uh, we had yesterday a uh, talk about the results from the first uh, project for Arctic Game Lab called Innovation Game. And we had some scientists also following up on that. Uh, and that was a really good talk. Uh, it's available on our YouTube channel. So if you missed it yesterday, you can uh, find it in our channel. And we will have a link in our chat now. Um, on other news, uh, Arctic uh, Equality Talk. Uh, it's the last of four uh, Arctic Equality Talks this afternoon at uh, half past three. Uh, today's guest is Jenny Brusk. Brusk, uh, senior lecturer at uh, the University of Skövde and moderator of Donna. Uh, her talk will be about networking for females in the game industry. Uh, on other news uh, as well is that uh, this week would have seen the Arctic Game Week, but unfortunately to the global pandemic COVID-19, uh, we um, have had to cancel that. But uh, on the good news is that we will uh, this week have a, meet uh, a meeting which starts the production for it in the next year's uh, Arctic Game Week. Yeah, it's a shame. Yes. We'll be, we will be working night and day now with the Arctic Game Conference and yes. Motion and everything. Yes, so for a year. It's a shame that we can't do it. No. Nope. But that's how it is. <laughs> All right, uh, we also have a guest with us today. We have Sebastian Oyala from Limit Break Studios. It's uh, hi. hi, Sebastian. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Super. So uh, you are one of the studios in the Arctic Game Lab region. Can you tell us a bit about your company and what you're doing? Uh, right now, Limit Break, we, we started as just uh, an in the company, three people in the team. Uh, but now we've grown and Limit Break has become more of a, <clears throat> a cluster of independent studios coming together, making a foundation with publisher networks, investors, and uh, a lot of creative freedom. And we work between the studios a lot. So Sounds yeah. amazing. And you, yeah. you uh, participated in the Arctic Game Pitch this year uh, with uh, several of your studios and you Several of the studios also got through. Yeah. Uh, so, so which are the games that you're developing for the pitch? Uh, the games, I actually don't have, it's one that doesn't really have a name yet. We have uh, Chancey Club and uh, another one. <laughs> we're, we're in the name right now, so yeah, but, but we're working on them. Uh, so we have one team that's, that's working uh, up here in, in Boden, so we have me and Max working at the office and the other ones from home. And then another, another team that split. It's mostly up here in the north, but yeah, all over Sweden and we also have a guy in Spain. Ah, cool. Working on it. Cool. So uh, uh, you are one of eight companies that also got through the pitch. Um, how was that process and do you see that you, you that there's any help for your company now that you, you have been through it? Uh, yeah, I think during the pandemic now it's kind of bo both. It, it's, it feels bad to say that good things come out of it, but uh, but I think it's it's another way to work. I've been through Art Game Pitch before, and that was more of a hectic experience. And I think now we have more support, and we can. It's it's a tad bit lower pace, so it's yeah. You can you can do a, a bit better, I think. But yeah, we get a lot of support from uh, Christopher and, and Arctic Game Lab. So, and, and yeah, it's easier, you, you, you're used to the web meetings, so you have a lot of meetings and it's, it's easier than to come to places, see people. And we're in Boden, Arctic Game Lab is mostly in Skellefteå. So this, I, I have a positive experience this time. Sounds very good. good. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things we we pushed you or push pushed the companies in the Arctic Game Pitch uh, to be a part of was the European Games BizDev Gathering. It was a digital conference to support indie developers all over Europe 
to get the, the indies to meet publishers and investors. Uh, what's your experience from that? Um, very good. Actually, it's, uh, we missed most part, most the first day, uh, unfortunately, but uh, we had a few good meetings and especially the second day. Uh, it's, yeah, there's, there's lots of companies there and uh, we got a lot, lots of requests coming in later also. So we're booking in some meetings afterwards. So it's, that, that was a really good thing. The, the meet, meet to match thing is really, really good. Sounds good. So uh, I guess you will be participating in more digital conferences and so on. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Will you be a part of the Nordic game that starts now uh, 27th of May? And uh, that's the plan, yeah. Cool. cool. All right. Thank you very much and uh, keep up the good work in Boden. Thank you. All right, so uh, back to uh, news. Uh, we have some local news as well. Uh, the local Umeå studio, Torilla, is looking for uh, developers. Uh, they're especially looking for uh, junior programmers uh, that loves Unity, game development, and uh, of course it's a bonus if you also like uh, motorcycles and so on, since uh, they are one of the biggest publishers when it comes to that kind of games. Yes, and uh, on that note, um, Mindforce, uh, that's working on uh, gamifying the health business, is hiring back-end developers as well. Uh, they're looking for an experienced and responsible back-end developer uh, for their Schlefte office. Yeah, uh, and some some uh, bad news as well. We have a press release from Gold Town Games that said that uh, they have a net sales increase by 33% compared to last quarter, but it's still a 27% decrease uh, compared to last year. Uh, and the CEO, Per Hultgren, says that it's uh, very strange times now uh, since uh, Corona hit, hit the sports so hard. So it uh, totally changed their game plan. But they're still uh, looking forward to uh, the recruitment of uh, Wayne Gretzky as a, uh, a game ambassador has been really positive, making them, making Canada the, the biggest market for their uh, hockey game, actually. And they're also uh, stated in another press release that are going forward with their soft release of their football manager game now in, in Southern Europe. So hopefully the football season will start there. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Um... Turborilla's uh, upcoming game, uh, Mad Skills Motocross 3, um, is listed as Pocket Gamer, uh, as by Pocket Gamer, one of the top games currently in soft launch as well. That's really interesting as well. Yeah, and we also have uh, some other good news. Uh, Lin Marie Edlund, uh, which uh, who works for uh, Amplify Game Invest, uh, was just uh, just became an ambassador for Women in Games, and we have her with us. Hello, Lynn Marie. Hi. Hi. So, uh, Women in Games, so sounds great. Um, could you tell us a bit about what this means? Well, um, it means that I can um, help other females in the industry, like women from like school, college and universities, and uh, be able to encourage them and help them in their careers in the gaming industry. and. Of course, I've done that before, but now I have women in games um, in my back, so that's that's very helpful. And it's a great community that spreads all over the, the world, basically. So, and uh, they they um, uh, they also, uh, I mean, I think we are like 38 new ambassadors uh, this month. So, and from like different parts of Europe. So that's cool. It's really, really good news, and it's uh, super positive for all the female game developers up here in the Arctic region as well. So, and a, a super uh, congratulations from from all of us. Yes, congratulations. Thank you so much. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good. Uh, so, uh, if you have any news you think we should shout out uh, here at the Arctic Game Talk, please email us at uh, news at arcticgamelab.com. Uh, 
So we also have some global and event news. Yes, uh, King makes the default engine open source. Uh, so the mobile giant King uh, has switched its default uh, game engine to an open source model. Uh, the, game, the game engine is primarily used for 2D uh, games development. Uh, and browsers, uh, for, and mobile mostly, uh, such as their own uh, Blossom Blast saga. Um, King aimed to invite uh, external developers to help improve the engine and make its ongoing uh, development more transparent in the future. Cool, so it's an opportunity for all our mobile game developers yes, up here. Yes, I think so. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, over to events. We have a Nordic game starts their digital event now May 27th to May 29th. Uh, and we have an opportunity to give away tickets for that. So if you're interested, you should contact us and we'll uh, help you with that. You could please send an email just to u1 at arcticgamelab.com and I'll hook you up or, as soon as I can. Yes. On a sadder note though, uh, uh, the Spiel uh, in Essen has been cancelled, as well as Gen Con, unfortunately. So no Spiel and no Gen Con this year. Sad news. Yeah, really. Yes. <laughs> uh, and the, the last news for the day is that Sweden Game Pitch will be June 17th using Meet to Match. And uh, they uh, want to invite Swedish startups uh, for the, these pitch sessions. So uh, for... for uh, uh, Arctic Game Lab companies, it's uh, available for free and you should uh, sign up as soon as you can before June the 3rd. And we will have a link for that as well in the chat. All right, that's it for the news part. So uh, it's time for the guest for the week. Yes. Hi everyone, great to be here. I'm just gonna share my screen. Hi Susanna, welcome. Hi, should I, let's see here. Do you wanna say anything or should I just get going? I, I think you could get going. Uh, we're just really happy to have you here. I could uh, say uh, that we will have, as usual, we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. Hmm. So uh, please write your questions in the Q&A tool and we'll try to, to and go through them all in the end. Yes, yeah. please do so that. Please that go ahead. Great. Okay, so great. Great to be here. My name is Susanna Mesagraham and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the business of games and perhaps in particular uh, building and uh, getting investment funds uh, into your studio and your team. And uh, I think it's uh, super important for any developer that uh, sets out on their own to have an idea of what it takes to build a business and also have their minds on uh, some of the uh, business aspects of, of what we do, not just the creative side, but also the business side. That doesn't mean you need to have a finance degree. It doesn't mean you can't be, you know, focusing on the art of creating uh, games. Uh, but I do think it's a way to ensure that you have um, a little bit of, of control, um, a little bit of insight into your destiny and, and, and where that's going. So that's what I'll be focusing on today. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, my experiences, so that you know who I am and why I'm making the claims that I'm making. So uh, a little bit about me. I've had tons of jobs before I joined the games industry. I started working when I was 13 and I've done everything from working in factories to uh, photo labs to selling stuff door to door. Uh, and just before I joined uh, Paradox, I, um, I ran an NGO in Sweden for uh, four years, two years full time, two years beside, like on the side of my studies. And I spent almost a year in London working uh, with marketing. And so most of the time in games I've spent at Paradox Interactive, I joined the company when it was a fairly small company, a 12, I think I was employee number 12 coming in. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how that happened later on. And now I run an investment company together with two other partners um, where we invest in uh, tech and games, founders that run tech and games companies. And I also uh, do some other things on the side. I work with different organizations that um, are active in the uh, integration and inclusive 
uh, arena. If you want to know a little bit more about me, about what I've done at Paradox, some of my thoughts on different things, I can recommend this podcast that I did uh, a while back, uh, actually several years back, uh, because I'm not going to go that much into details. But uh, if you want to have a deeper look into who I am, I can recommend it. OK, now, Paradox. Um, I always say that it's a bit of a coincidence that I ended up in games. I was working in London with marketing and I realized fairly quickly that I wasn't driven by knowing that my sales targets had gone up 0.5% that year in Germany. Like that didn't really, I couldn't really see a connection between my contribution and, uh, and the results. And so I knew I wanted to do something work somewhere where that contribution was a bit clearer, possibly somewhere a bit smaller because I was at a big multinational company. Um, I also knew that I wanted to go back to Sweden and Sweden at that time didn't have any jobs, any marketing jobs. Uh, it was 2004 and there was about one marketing job a week advertisements.com. So I basically like applied uh, for everything. And then all of a sudden I saw this ad from a company in games that was looking for um, support on their marketing side. So they wanted someone who had international marketing experience. And the ad specifically said, you don't have to be a gamer because we're all gamers. So we want you to come in with a different perspective. Don't know if I would have applied otherwise. Um, and also that uh, they uh, were mostly uh, men and they uh, would uh, be really happy to see some more female candidates. So I applied, turns out I was perfect for the role. And uh, while it was a coincidence that I ended up in games, I always say it was a highly conscious uh, decision to stay in games. Um, in it, I found a lot of that um, passion and purpose that I had previously experienced in my NGO or the NGO that I, uh, I ran called ISEC, which was a global um, student organization. And so there's a lot of passion and dedication and people cared a lot about what we were doing which felt very meaningful. Um, there's also a lot of creativity. While I didn't work in developing games and uh, on the development side, on the marketing side, I had to uh, make sure that our games were marketed and there was awareness of them uh, all over the world, even though we hardly had any money. We didn't have a really big budget, which some of you might recognize. So how do you create something out of nothing that requires quite a lot of creativity. And so those, especially those early years were a lot of fun, but also a lot of really, really hard work. And then of course, um, seeing to uh, the business side of it, not just in terms of like the actual numbers, making ends meet, paying, you know, having a payroll to pay um, us employees, but also how do you build an organization? How do you scale? How do you recruit? How do you develop teams? How do you set you know, your vision, where you want to go, the direction? How do you communicate that? All of those things. Um, so I was very involved in, I would say, almost everything that didn't have to do directly with um, game development. Don't ask me to develop games because that's not what I'm good at. Um, and during this time, games became hot. I mean, when I joined, people were like, you're white, you're joining the games industry. Like, is that even a thing? What do you do there? And over the years, um, the games industry became bigger and bigger, not just globally, but especially in Sweden. Uh, those first years, we didn't even, I didn't even mention that we were a Swedish company because we were mostly active in the US. Talking about getting big bang for your buck, we knew that everything we did in the US, we would um, get trickle off effects in other countries as well without having to pay for it. So we were very active there, didn't talk about being Swedish. And then now um, being a Swedish company or a Swedish game developer is a, is a badge of honor uh, because we've achieved so much uh, in the industry here. So it ended up being 14 years and um, Paradox will always be very close to my heart. I was involved in a few little projects when I left. The alumni network was one of them. Um, and now I'm still very active uh, in the, the Swedish games industry as a whole, as a spokesperson and as an advisor, and then of course also through my company. Now, I could probably fill a book with some of the learnings from Paradox, but I selected a few that I think might be relevant for this talk. One of them is that 
I think in games, at least this is my experience, uh, we're quite good at realizing that different can be a little bit of our superpower. Um, I have met so many unique uh, individuals in this industry who have accomplished so much um, that might not have had the chance to sort of be able to bloom out and, and really show their potential in some, of, uh, some other industries. So I think that that's, um, that's actually one of the keys of why we've been so successful as an industry. And in my case, I was certainly very different, not just, you know, from the outside in terms of my competence, in terms of like coming from, from a completely different um, industry and also, uh, you know, my, my, my gender, but also because I'm a very emotional person, um, I get very, you know, quite extrovert. Uh, in a lot of ways, um, I was, you know, different than, than a lot of my peers. And I think once you're able to own that and once you're able to really capitalize on that, I really noticed how that can become your superpower. Um, I think culture is something that we focused a lot on. The first years we did it unintentionally, un unintentionally. We were very clear on what we wanted to build and who we wanted to be and, and how we wanted to do it. And we had a lot of discussions about it, which is easy when you're 20 people or five. But once you start reaching 50 or 100, or maybe 200 or 300, you need to put a little bit more conscious effort into it. So that was always key. And the way we achieved it and the way we discussed and talked about it looked different throughout the, the years. But it's definitely something that I think every studio uh, needs to, to have their eyes on. And things can change very quickly. If you're three people and recruit one person, then all of a sudden you've already changed the dynamics of the group, right? Another thing is that the games industry is super collaborative and we want everyone to feel included and want to, you know, uh, everyone to have a say and feel very empowered about what we're doing. And sometimes that means that we can talk a lot, right? I don't know how many meetings I've sat at, but there's a lot of discussions about things. And then in the end, everyone walks away and thinks that we've made some kind of decision, but we don't really know exactly what decision was made. So I think that in order to become really successful in this industry, it's important to make decisions in the end as well. By all means, discuss, you know, as much as you feel like you have time and, and need for, but there has to be decisions made along the way for you to progress and advance. Another thing is leadership. I had a really interesting conversation with one of my founders um, the other day, and she was talking about how in certain tech uh, circles, they talk about, um, technical moats that become sort of the, the barriers of, you know, the things that you don't want to share with your competitors, right? And, uh, and she said that the games industry is so collaborative and, and we share so much and that doesn't seem to be the same kind of moats that we build up between the companies. Like we'll happily share things that work for us, contacts, you know, if one company does well, it's, it's good for the industry. And I think one of the reasons is because even if you have the same, give the same design document to three different teams, you're not going to get exactly the same game out of these three teams. So if games is, um, you know, it's not, it's not, you can't just follow a blueprint and that's, that's you know, you, you get the, the final product if you're building a bridge or whatever you're doing. Um, and if you're working in games, you know this yourself. So what is it that makes, um, makes this design document become three different games. Well, it's obviously the people, but I also think it's the leadership around it and how you sort of uh, yeah, manage, not just manage the team, but how everyone kind of can come to their right and, 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 and use their competences and their soft skills and their hard skills in the best possible way to shape this game together. Um, and so leadership is like a crucial, crucial component and I'm going to get back to that a little bit when I talk about Aldeon as well and, and how we view things. Um, but it's something that certainly at Paradox was a huge focus from the beginning and, and still is, um, I believe, because we all came from uh, a background where we had seen what, um, what strong focus on, on leadership and also self-leadership uh, can accomplish. And then I used to always say at Paradox, and this is something that was very, um, it sort of in, was in the DNA of the company, but also something that I believed in very strongly, 
I believe that individuals can be fantastic, but individuals can never um, be fantastic at the cost of the team. And I think especially in games, it becomes so apparent that the team, to, like when the team is well functioning and when everyone, like I said, um, is, is doing what they were meant to be doing in that team, that's when you get the best possible results in terms of both the game, in terms of, you know, satisfaction and fulfillment and purpose and all of that. Um, so I think that's that's quite important. And that's also something that I look at very much when I build my own teams and, and when I choose to work with, with individuals, that it has to be people who make other people better around them uh, as well, and not just like that one individual, even though that one individual can, of course, be important. All right, uh, one other thing that I wanted to talk about, I think before we go over to, to more specifically to Aldion is, um, I believe that you can improve your luck or increase your odds tremendously by doing two things. And if you spend 10% of the time that you're spending on learning a new programming language or learning how to become a better level designer or whatever your craft is, then I think that you're actually uh, improving the odds uh, in your favor. And those two things is self-leadership and self-awareness. And if you think of self-leadership as, as sort of that map, you know, like you have a map and you might have some areas that are grayed out and that are unknown and that you don't really know what's happening further down the line. But as you do your experiences, you make decisions, et cetera, the map becomes clearer and clearer. Uh, if that's your self-leadership, making sure that you're actually getting ahead, then self-awareness can be your compass, deciding in which direction and which area you want to explore more at the moment. And the more you know about what gives you energy, what you're naturally good at, what you can do without spending loads of uh, efforts on, on it, uh, the smarter you're going to be able to be when it comes to taking decisions and uh, capitalizing on opportunities that are coming in your way. So I don't know if the re this resonates with you, but like my, if you don't remember anything else from this talk, I would say that uh, practicing self-leadership and getting better at self-leadership and also constantly learning more about yourself and becoming more aware of your likes, your dislikes, what you're good at, is like really a, a surefire way to um, to help you along the way and, and like I said increase your odds of, of having luck because luck is often also um, a result of not just coincidence but a lot of other things uh, underlying things right and this is especially important I think when you're putting together a team that complements each other where you have best companies the best teams that I've seen people know what they bring to the table and what the others bring to the table and how you complement each other. You can't be good at everything, but you definitely have certain things that you bring to the table that are unique for you and that nobody else can bring as good as you. All right, um, one of the things that I often find myself talking about with teams is, like I said, the business side of things, right? Um, is this a donation you're looking for or is it an investment? And why do I think that's an important distinction to make? If you want to sit in your room and create your art and just be left alone and do your own thing, that is 100% fine. You can do whatever you want. But if you want someone else to pay for it, then that's either a donation or you have to realize that the person making an investment in you wants some kind of return of this investment. Usually it's, you know, seeing your investment grow monetarily, but it could also be a different kind of investment. But I think that once you start talking to people about wanting money, you need to be clear on the fact that a donation is not the same as an investment. You know, you need to have a different approach and a different strategy depending on what it is that you're seeking. Okay, now let's see if I can move this. Here we go. All right, so in games, we're fortunate enough. I know it's tough uh, sometimes to understand where you can get your funding from, but in general, we're fortunate that there are different uh, types of funding and different type of investors that you can go to. And so one of them is obviously a publisher, depending on what you have, what kind of deal you have with a publisher, uh, you might get your... Um, your development uh, team funded, or you might get 
uh, up to a certain milestone funded. Uh, and then the deals can look, and the terms can look a bit different depending on uh, where the publisher goes in, what their business models are like, who takes the most risk, et cetera, et cetera. The pub publisher is, is, is one um, aspect. And then it could be either through equity or it could be uh, investing in just that game. And then you have a whole bunch of funds that have popped up now. And I think one of the funds that's really interesting is Wings. Um, and they do, let's see if I get this right now, they help fund teams and games. And um, I believe it's a profit share. So like you share revenue. Um, I don't know exactly the terms, but, but that's, uh, that's sort of the gist of it. And then you have angels, business angels. And I believe from what I've heard, this is a little bit more common on the tech scene than it is in games, but it's starting to become more common in games as well. So angels are people, private persons who have money and capital to invest and who might be really, you know, uh, excited about a specific game idea or they want to um, support a specific individual. And usually the amounts are a little bit lower. So you might typically have a group of angels that, that go in and, and, um, and fund, help fund maybe a specific milestone. Maybe it's a prototype you want to have funding so that you can actually then go and shop around for publishers or, or what it could be. And you have the equity investors, and this is where Aldion com uh, comes in. We come in this category. Uh, someone who believes in you and believes in your team and wants to invest against a stake in your company. And so uh, there are um, a few of those around as well. Um, the difference with Aldion uh, is, is maybe that we are, uh, you know, the structure um, of, of, of our company, that we're not a fund, we're not a VC, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that after. And then you have a tons of incubators and accelerators. We have Sting, uh, we have a few others uh, that, I mean, you know, we're, we're sitting here talking to Arctic Game Lab now. They also support a lot of smaller um, studios and, and teams uh, with different things, with competence, even, you know, depending on what the, the setup could be. So that's, that's also an option. Some of them take, um, I want an equity stake, even if it's a small one, and some just do it because that's in their mission and their purpose. And then you have the uh, uh, organizations that uh, help smaller businesses. So not specifically games, but smaller businesses in general. So like Almi, Vinova, Tilvexweket, all of those. So there are different uh, options. And I think that it's important to be aware of what you sign up for when you choose an option and also what kind of what's expected of you in terms of uh, uh, if you sign up for this, what's expected for you to deliver, not just in you know, the game itself or the product itself, but also um, in terms of like building your business. Okay. Now, the reason we started Aldean, I'm just gonna check what time it is, so I'm... Uh, the reason we started Aldeon is um, I, after, well, actually a little before as well, but I've been uh, doing some individual investments in games and uh, tech companies, smaller startups. Um, and uh, I've done it as an angel. In some cases, I've done a little bit of a larger investment. In some cases, I've done like a, a slightly smaller investment. And so I've been doing this on my own. I had a colleague, a former colleague, who'd also done uh, some investments on his own. And he started talking to another friend of his um, about maybe starting something together. Uh, and we started talking about this, the three of us, and realized that our competences complement each other really well. Like we all bring something different to the table. Again, having self-awareness to know, self-knowledge to know, what you're good at, what you bring into the table and how you can complement each other. We've all individually done investments on the side. What happens if we do it together instead of doing it individually? There are certain things that I can't provide to my founders and to the teams that I work with that my colleagues could potentially do because they are better at that than I am or they know more in a certain area than I do. And so that's how the conversation started. And uh, in January this year, we decided to make it official. So we have actually merged several of our individual holdings into one company called Aldeon. And uh, we have about 20 holdings right now. And it's a mix between uh, games companies and, and tech companies and in different stages. And uh, the focus for Aldeon going forward 
uh, will be to go in fairly early. Um, so the team is a team that I've been in a privileged position to handpick people who I trust very much, um, who I believe share my values in terms of like uh, being highly trustworthy, making sure that we are always working uh, on creating win-win situations for the founders and helping them along the way, um, et cetera. There's like a whole bunch of, of things that we discussed before we decided to go into business together. And the portfolio, like I said, consists of different uh, sized companies, different stages, uh, mostly in, uh, in locally, uh, but we do have a few uh, companies that are uh, in different countries as well. We will try and focus a little bit more locally just because this is where we have our network. This is where we know how things are done. A lot of our founders need help with uh, the administration of running a business, Bolagsverket, Nya Missioner, all of those kind of things. And those are things that we can help with here. But for instance, in Canada, I wouldn't have a clue about how that works. Uh, in terms of the future, like I said, uh, we, are, um, we have a portfolio of, of 20 companies. So one of our key things is we wanna be active owners um, for the founders that we work with at the moment. And we're still a fairly small team. So we're not looking to aggressively uh, invest in a lot more uh, new companies, but we are looking at studios and companies and teams or individuals who wanna build their teams, who we feel uh, where there's a good match between what we can bring to the table and what they're looking for. And also where, um, where we can come in early enough that we can actually build something really uh, exciting together. So there will be a couple of more investments, but we're not looking to double our holdings, for instance, in the next couple of years. We'll, we'll be a little bit picky and, and we hope that we find um, the people who, who really think that we're right um, for them. All right, so like I said, Aldion, we invest in, uh, in teams or individuals. I often get asked, oh, this team that you're working with, what's their game like? And, and of course I can answer that, but we're not really investing in one game because our horizon is much more long-term than that. There are investors out there and there are uh, entities that invest games specifically, but we don't. We invest in a company, a team, a business, um, not necessarily in the game that they're doing at the moment. Um, we are not game developers. So where we come in and where we support is to build the business, build the company, build the studio. And that can look very different. I mean, we have companies, studios that are two people. Obviously, they might not be in a stage or even desire to grow at the moment. So then we will take a step back and help with other things instead. Um, but in general, we're not the ones to go to if you just want to have a lot of input on your game and otherwise be left alone. Like we want to build something with you together, um, a studio. Um, we expect that if we go in and uh, give of our time and give of our money, that there will be a certain valuation for that based off of our experience. So just like we're, let's put it this way. Um, we wouldn't put ourselves, um, on the same level as, as maybe just one of the investors that is looking to invest in games because they think it's an interesting uh, industry where they can make a buck. Uh, we would expect someone to value um, Aldion as someone who can actually come in and help, um, I don't know, double or triple or quadruple the value of what, you're, or what we're creating uh, together. So, if that's not the right fit, then that's not the right fit. And there's no hard feelings, but that's the kind of discussion that we would have before we come in. Uh, we come in early because we believe that if we come in early, we can help people avoid some of those early founder mistakes. And it's also a way for us to truly understand the founder's vision and, and really try and have a, a good think about how we can help this founder um, bring or like uh, fulfill the vision that they have. Let's see, I had one more little thing there. Oh yeah, and then our long term for what we're trying to do is uh, our horizon, our time time perspective is, is long term, which means that I said we're a little bit different from a VC or a fund in the sense that we don't have a cap after five years, we have to sell and move on. 
like as long as it makes sense for us to continue to be owners and as long as we're like on this journey together we don't really have like a, a fixed um, time limit that's really up to to us working together um, then I have a couple of additional points that are sort of my points that I think are super important. And one of them is, and I realize this thing is so long now, you can't really see the, there we go. I've chosen the partners that I've chosen to work with now. And a lot of people that I've done business with over the years on their ability to willingness to learn and listen. And I think that's actually key in business. If you think that you're already, you you've already been taught everything that you can be taught. Nobody else can come in and provide a different perspective. You're already fully grown, that's it. Then I'm not probably the right person to work with. Um, so I think that that's a super important trait. And actually one of the reasons why we've, um, you know, walk, chosen to walk away uh, in some instances where we feel like we have nothing to, 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 to contribute here because there is no willingness to listen. Um, I think there's, there should be an interest. You don't have to know or have the knowledge yourself about business and how to build a business, but there has to be an interest. At Paradox, I love the way the studio used to frame it in the sense that uh, a great game is a game that people want to play, but are also willing to play uh, pay for. And I think that shows a certain respect for the player in the sense that we're creating something here that we're expecting you to pay for. Uh, that perspective is important and I think is equally important to have that when you're building the business. And if you're not interested in that, that's totally fine, but then we're not right for you. Uh, and then I said again, the leadership aspect. You don't have to be a fantastic leader. Most leaders can improve. Uh, along the way. Nobody is ever done being, you know, I, I'm now a perfect leader. I can never develop more. Uh, but there has to be an understanding that if you're building something, a business, a team, a game, then being able to gather people around you, inspire them, and make them better um, is, is a key component. Again, you can always learn to be better, but there has to be an understanding that this is like something that, that should be focused on. All right, um, this is like super, super uh, big overview uh, on a lot of topics that have a lot of nuances and details. Uh, again, in the q and I'll be happy to answer some questions. And if anyone wants to reach out to me afterwards to have a private conversation, that's totally fine too. Um, but for the purpose of, of this, uh, this event, I'm going to leave it at that. But before I, I uh, go over to the q and I just wanted to say as well that these are actually really trying times and, and different people handle it uh, differently. And also I find, I don't know if you find it, but other, I find that my mood and, and my energy varies even like sometimes even during a day, no, uh, not to mention over a week. So I think it's important to be kind to yourself, um, to allow yourself time to debrief. We're now talking about building a business and building a studio. Uh, maybe if you're not uh, up for it at this time, that's okay too. Maybe it's okay to just stop up and be who you are supposed to be right now and, and work on like developing a certain skill, maybe understanding a little bit more about yourself, train yourself in self-leadership or whatever it could be. But maybe you don't have to embark on your life's biggest adventure at the moment. Some of you might be ready for it and some of you might not. And that's okay. So just be kind to yourself. Make sure you ask for support if you need it. Um, I wanted to to bump uh, uh, this app called Self Care App from a company called True Love, which seems to be providing a lot of comfort for a lot of people that are um, stuck at home uh, right now. Um, so I wanted to um, tell you so you can go and, and check it out and maybe it'll help you if you're having a tough time um, navigating through all the uncertainties that we um, find now at the moment. So that's a little bit about me. I hope I've been able to, to provide some insights in how I think and uh, maybe a little bit of insight into the world of investments, which is something that I'm learning more about every day as well. And with that, I guess we can go over to the Q&A. The same Q&A. Here you go. 
All right, super. It was uh, fantastic to listen to you, Susanna. Thank you. Uh, some really good insights. Uh, we have nice. a question already, and, and uh, please, if you have any more questions, just hammer them in the Q&A, and we'll try to go through them all. Yeah, we actually have a, uh, a couple of questions here from Magnus Söderberg. Uh, I'll start with this first. Uh, the question I ask all investors, if you generalize, what would you say a, pre, say a pre-seed seed round would be in size and for what amount of equity? Uh, there's a, the reason why you usually probably don't get a, a direct response to this question is because I find that there's uh, like as many responses to this question as there is um, studios that are looking or companies that are looking for it. Um, I would say pre-seed is obviously smaller uh, and also it depends on who's coming in. I think that again, if you're shopping around town for investors that are looking for uh, you know, to make a quick buck, then the equity and the like, the what you take money in for should be different than if you say bring in someone who's like in the know how from the industry, etc. Uh, I'm sure there are some uh, some statistics around this, but I wouldn't feel comfortable um, sharing with you uh, on behalf of others and also uh, maybe what we are what we're talking about at, at Albion because it would be to generalize too much. Okay, thank you. Another question uh, from Magnus as well is, uh, what are the top three slides in a deck you think are the most important? Uh, in a deck, I think uh, uh, what you want to accomplish, like what is it that you're aiming for? Uh, not just the next milestone or whatever it could be, but long term, what are you looking for? Who are the people that are going to do it? If it's just like one or two people that are on board right now, you need to recruit the rest of the team, that's fine. But then we're going to invest in those individuals that are at in place right now so that's obviously important and then off obviously also like what are you looking for in terms of like how much equity are you willing to let go and what what is it like what kind of money uh, are you looking for so those would be the top three like what are your long-term goals who is the team and what are you looking for in terms of um, equity and in terms of valuation and I think for the right partner, you can actually have a really open and honest conversation about um, valuation. Because from what I've learned and what I've seen, uh, there's no point in, again, if you're bringing in people who can actually help you build value in your company to put yourself too high and end up with the wrong quote unquote uh, partners uh, in your company. Partners and the, the investors that you bring in early are going to be absolutely crucial in building your company uh, moving forward. So I think that um, having an, an open conversation with, um, you know, some of that might not perhaps be interested in investing, but just wants to help you out in terms of valuation is, is super important. So there should be something on there, uh, your thoughts, but be very open if you have no idea. Cool. Um, and a follow-up question on the deck thing is, do, do you prefer a deck with mainly bullet points and then a second document, for example, an investment memo with more info or, do you, or a deck with more info in it from the start? I usually, we usually ask questions regardless how much details are on the, on the deck. Uh, I think my preference is definitely a bullet point deck and then you can ask additional questions. So get me interested. Give me a good idea what it is that you're trying to build, and then all the other things we can um, we can uh, look at if, if if we're you know interested um, to to pursue it uh, further. Um, thank you. Uh, and the last one from Magnus uh, is that ha have you looked at blockchain for games, and what do you think of it in that case? No, no, that's not an area that we've uh, explored specifically, and it's not an area that I know uh, a lot about. Uh, again, we're not, you know, we're, we're not going to come in and tell you how to run your business in terms of like what you're creating and what you're developing. That's for you to tell us what you want to do. At the moment, we haven't really had any strong cases or any pitches in this area but i know people who run studios that um, use blockchain and they are very very passionate about it uh, but it's not something that we've uh, worked so much with thank you now let's see there's another question yes there's down. another one from nicole yeah. lee does aldion have uh, any top suggestion for very early stage game uh, game companies 
I'm not really sure what that means, top suggestions. Oh, for like looking for investors? Is that the question? What do you think? I think that's probably what she meant, yes. Top suggestions. Oh, and no, 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 hold on, I get it now. Do I have any top suggestions on what to focus on for very early stage game companies? Could that be it? In general, operational focus. Yeah, yeah I think that uh, focus is really important. Uh, I think it's important not to be all over the place and want to create uh, too much. Um, pitches that I don't like are pitches when people tell me this industry is worth this much and if we can only get a percentage of this industry then we will make you know x y and z uh, return. Um, that is not really relevant like the, the size of the total market even though it's of course, the market is big, but it's all about what kind of niche and what kind of stake you can take uh, in it. That's what's relevant. So I would say focus. Um, think about the fact that if you get the right people on board, you don't have to secure your entire investment at the same time. So you can actually, like for instance, now we're in the process of, um, you know, in financing rounds for some of our companies where uh, um, they've been able to raise enough money to create a prototype or where they've been able to, to raise enough money to reach uh, the first couple of milestones and then you start asking for, for more money. So uh, that would be the other thing. Uh, it's better to be able to take yourself to a couple of milestones than not to be able to um, raise the money because you're going out too strong. Um, so that's two, focus and um, in terms of what you're asking for. And then the third one would be, we've invested in founders where we feel that the personal on chemistry works and where we believe that there's a semblance of this person being able to achieve what they want to achieve. And not necessarily exactly the plan that's in the, in the plan or like the goals that are in the plan, but that has the potential to, when things have to pivot, which they always have to do, has the potential to pivot and to handle changes along the way. So I would say be personal, especially in games. Uh, it's it's a, very much based on, on relationships. Um, so don't feel like you have to put on your professional face. Um, this is, this is personal and this is very, you know, most successful game companies um, are very, make it very personal. So don't be afraid to, to show that uh, in your talks and also in your deck. Thank you. Um, we have another uh, question here. Uh, does a team have to have a game pitch ready to be interesting? Or, and how much value do you put in the game pitch versus the team itself? Like composition, experience, purpose, etc. Um, well, if I, if I say this, there is a, um, an actor on the market that creates uh, the start, that's like a startup generator. It's called Antler. Um, and they put together people with an idea and with people who maybe want to um, be a startup founder, but don't necessarily have the idea, but have the know-how. And sometimes they even provide the idea for them. Um, we have... Uh, in the past had ideas where we've recruited the team for it and then started up the, um, the, the company, as we as an Albion. But in general, it's hard to invest in just people if there's no ideas there, right? So if, if, if we have to come with all, again, we're not game developers, if we have to come with the idea for a game, then chances are that's not going to be a super um, good game or a super interesting game but it doesn't have to be a ready game right it could be a semblance a seed a, a, an idea and in that case you have to be super clear on that that's what you're asking money for to explore this further and and realistically the money that you're going to be able to get for developing your thoughts further is going to be less than if you have something a little bit more concrete that pe people can start counting on super um, so we don't have any more questions, uh, but I do have some questions. Uh, yes. One of them is just uh, thinking about Arctic Game Lab. I mean, we as, as, as Arctic Game Lab try to develop the northern region and support companies to, to grow a big games industry. Uh, now you're situated in, in Stockholm. What's your feeling when it comes to Arctic Game Lab? Have you heard of us? Do you see any opportunities here and so on? 
Well, we, we've met, so I've heard of you and I know what you guys are doing. Um, I see a lot of opportunity in uh, not just uh, developing the Stockholm region, uh, but of course there are a lot of um, money, talent, experience uh, and opportunities in Stockholm, for sure. I think there's ways for the North to capitalize, well, all areas in Sweden really to capitalize on that. Uh, I like the idea of having smaller clusters. Um, in our case, what we've found as well is that um, for Aldeon, I think we need to have a little bit, like we need to have the promise of, of a little bit of scale because we're not going to be able to invest in too many companies because we are doing this so much. We're, we're putting so much of ourselves into it, time and effort that um, we can't have too many companies that are like smaller studios working on, on, on smaller games. There has to be a little bit of a um, potential, at least for scale. And my understanding of Arctic Game Lab and a few other places is that a lot of that's teams and a lot of the projects are fairly um, small scale. And I think that those kind of teams lend themselves quite well for angel investors. There's a lot of people, we're very fortunate in Sweden that there's a lot of people who have made money in games and who are very willing to and interested in helping the ecosystem grow. So I don't know if that answers your question. I think it's good that there's a cluster there. I think it's great that you know, we're not just growing the ecosystem in Stockholm, but whether or not Aldeon is the right investor for a lot of these companies, that, that would remain to be seen. Yeah. Super. Uh, I was also thinking um, about what you usually bring to the table when you invest in a company. In terms of experience? Yeah, I mean, besides money, yeah. what, what do you do? Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, my partner, Daniel, he's uh, been working as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, building companies for about 20 years. He's also actually worked in an investment company before, which is something that neither Andres nor I have done. Um, and so he brings a lot of knowledge in terms of like uh, both um, as, as the CEO and entrepreneur in terms of how you can think when you build and scale your company, a lot of in input in terms of like building a cap table, um, who, who should your owners be and how can you work with them in the best possible way, um, network, um, like you said, capital is not just our capital, but it's also like who would want to invest with us in following rounds is super important because uh, realistically, unless you get a smash hit, there will be need for some capital injection along the line. And then it's important that you have that network of people who are willing to, to kind of co-invest uh, with you. So that is what Daniel brings to the table. He actually is one of the people who's working uh, very operationally right now with several of our founders, helping them to grow their business. Um, and then we have Andras who worked with me at Paradox for seven years. And before then he worked with Nasdaq. So he did the whole Paradox IPO, for instance. Uh, he has a lot of, he has a very strong finance background. He's also very well versed in the legal side of things, has um, negotiated publishing deals before. So that's one of the things that he's been helping several of our companies do uh, negotiate and also review uh, publishing deals. And then he's also uh, in a lot of different boards. So add, adding uh, structure. He's also quite well connected and he's also done quite a lot of investments. So he knows um, how you should think. So both of these uh, guys have uh, operational, quite hands-on experience, but also more strategic, um, big picture experience. In terms of me, um, I've obviously done everything from like, I've even done websites and trailers, believe it or not, um, definitely not on par with what Paradox is doing now, but I've been very hands on on the marketing and communication side of things, scaling organizations, but also smaller teams, leadership, how to sort of build or communicate. Because a lot of the times founders have a very clear idea of what they want to build and how they want to do it, but not necessarily how to communicate it to other people. When you're one or two people, that's easy. But once you start recruiting people, how do you do that? So um, a lot of support and help in that. And also, also on the recruitment side, like I'm quite well connected. I have a big network. So just my experience from uh, building and scaling organizations and marketing and PR, I would say would be the, the biggest parts. So that's very concretely. And then, of course, there are other things as well, depending on what the founders need, but those would be the, the main things. 
Yeah. And how much time do you spend in the, the investments? Uh, uh, time it, with it, the companies yeah. that really depends on which stage they are in like we are in a lot of boards so that would be at least quarterly you have a board meeting but I mean we have a company where excuse me <coughs> we have companies where we have weekly meetings yeah. I think what we want to uh, avoid is uh, we don't want to become too operational because that also takes away some of the owners from the founders um, and what we want to avoid as well is uh, uh, removing ownership um, from, from the, the team that's actually doing it. I think that Paradox's board for me um, is a very, very good example of how you can give the management team a lot of mandate to run with things and then work as a facilitator more and just making sure that you have, you've crossed all your uh, uh, T's and dotted all your I's along the way. But it's everything from like, monthly or quarterly board meetings to weekly brainstorming sessions and planning sessions or helping them with rounds or whatever it could be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up to that uh, is, um, do, do you talk a lot about uh, leadership and uh, the, the, the act of leadership and uh, management. What is the one takeaway that you would give to someone new in the position of a leadership position? Uh, put, make some time to, to uh, develop your leadership whether it's having a mentor or going a course, like I've, I've done a few leadership courses myself. It's like the best invested time and money um, I've, I've ever spent. So I would say invest in it. Uh, you can be self-taught, of course, but I think that you will uh, cut off uh, many mistakes and a lot of unnecessary time if you do um, learn a few hands-on things uh, about leadership. Very interesting. And we got another one yes, here. Another uh, one. Would it be interesting? Would even. it be interesting? Yes. Oh, Two okay. So then we, we go start, for it. Yes, we'll start. Um, in order to pitch uh, for early stage investment, do you need a prototype, or is it is it enough to have a strong game idea and team? Um, we don't always get a prototype, so no, it's uh, it's enough to have um, a strong game idea and a team, but there has to be some kind of, like, we have to believe that there is some kind of potential that this team can actually uh, achieve something, right? So if you say that everything is new, like, we're going to do something in a new genre, we've never worked together, we've never had any other jobs except for school, like, chances are you're up for an uphill you know, battle. And that that's something that we are going to evaluate when we think if there's a chance that you'll be able to, to achieve this or not. So the answer is no, we don't need a prototype, but there has to be some kind of uh, belief that you can achieve what it is that you want to achieve. And with that said, you don't necessarily have to have that in the team. There are things that you can also get from the outside, right? In terms of advice, in terms of like people who are helping you or whatever. Hmm. Thank you. Um, and then we have uh, Ingrid Fride Sjö that asks, would it be interesting for you to invest in a company with a, a team of three, two to three people with the vision to become a much larger team uh, long term? Yeah, so in general, I think we've, um, of course, when we did our investments individually, we had other we all had our individual ways of looking at things. But now that we're doing it through Aldion, uh, I think we will, it, it would be very, very an outlier for us to invest in a team that didn't have the desire to scale long term. But yes, you can scale once it's, you know, suitable. Uh, you don't necessarily have to scale just for scaling, but there has to be some kind of idea that in the future we want to grow and we want to have a bigger impact. But for sure, it could be a small team to start out with, for sure. Okay. Um, we've got another one from Nicole Lee here. Uh, what kind of equity would you look for? Um, so it depends on when we go in. We've said that, um, let's see if I get the numbers right here. We've said that we don't want to have more than a 25% equity uh, over time. And this means like over rounds. I think that's something like maybe, you know, 10% or something like that. To 10, 15% uh, would probably be uh, preferable. And again, it doesn't have to be in the first round that um, you give away all the equity. Um, but for us to put all this time and effort into a company, uh, it wouldn't make sense for us to go in with too small of an equity and then we're just producing a lot of value for all the other shareholders, right? Like it has to be 
um, a little bit of return of investment for our time uh, as well. So maybe, you know, 10, 15%, something like that uh, over, over time. Yeah, good. So uh, the time is, uh, we're already uh, past our, our time. Uh, I have one last and, question. And I, I will say actually in some companies that we have invested in, we own a lot more than that. Uh, and uh, it, like, we don't have the objective to become a majority owner in any of our companies. Um, but it's for, for different reasons we have become uh, bigger owners. But, but I think that the sweet spot is somewhere there between 10, 25%. Super. So one last question from me before we end this round. Um, and that's about uh, Corona and COVID-19. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your feel on, on the investments? Uh, does it change anything? Is it uh, business as usual or, or, uh, or are, is it actually affecting how you reason when it comes to investments? Um, from what I can tell, a lot of people are now realizing that games is an industry that's doing fairly well during this time. So I'm not really sure if it's affected people's, because games is a hard business to uh, invest in. Um, so I think that I'm not really sure if it's affected people's willingness to invest in games, because I think that was fairly low uh, before as well. Um, but in general, when it comes to the investment climate. What we're seeing is that people are taking a longer time to decide, right? Because there's so much uncertainties further down the line. Uh, in, in our case, um, we are monitoring the market and, and, and what's happening and, and the uncertainties, but we are reviewing, like if we find the right company, it doesn't matter uh, if, if the market is uncertain, we'll, we have the funds to invest so, so we, can, uh, we can invest. All right. All right. Super. Well, thank you so much for participating. It was really, really interesting to listen on your, on your thoughts regarding this. Uh, and I hope we will see you here uh, next year for Arctic Game Week. It will be fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be a part of this talk. And like I said, if you want to share my contact information afterwards, if people want to reach out to me uh, as well, uh, if people want to have more specific feedback on there was a question about um, how much to go in with in, in pre-seed and seed. And again, it depends on the situation. But if, if people want to give me specific situations, then, then I can probably provide more specific feedback as well. Super. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. And have a good day. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.